Hello and welcome to Saving Democracy, What's Next for Wisconsin, this year's Lively Issues Forum from the League of Women Voters of Dane County. I'm Joy Cardine, member of the Dane County League and a board member with the League of Women Voters of Wisconsin. I'll be your moderator today and present our speaker, Matt Rothschild, with your questions and thoughts after we hear his remarks. Please type those questions in the Q&A section whenever the mood strikes you. So what are your hopes and fears about the state of democracy in Wisconsin in 2022? What needs to happen now to defend democracy from attempts to restrict voting, the effort to implement unfair maps, to the threats to subvert election results, efforts that have ramped up since the 2020 election based on the unfounded and disproven claims that the results were somehow rigged or the result of fraud. Our speaker will bring us up to date on some of these threats to democracy and share strategies to counter these threats. Plus, I hope, I know that we will also talk some about how we can stay hopeful and motivated in this important fight. Matt Rothschild is the executive director of the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign. He's the former editor and publisher of the Progressive Magazine, and he is the author of the new book, 12 Ways to Save Democracy in Wisconsin. Matt, thank you for being here. Thank you for writing this book and thank you for being on the front lines with the League of Women Voters and all the other groups who are trying to defend democracy. Well, thanks, Joy. It's always great to see you and thanks for inviting me to speak again to the League of Women Voters. I love the League and all its chapters. It's one of the most crucial organizations we have in this state for defending our democracy. So thank all of you for your interest uh, and for your activism. I got to say at the outset that I've never been more concerned about our democracy than I have been over the last year and a half. And here we are just a couple of days after the January 6th anniversary. And the big lie continues. President Biden was absolutely right in his speech the other day when he said that it represents a dagger at the throat of our democracy. And we've had our own collaborators in the January 6th coup attempt right here in Wisconsin with their fingerprints all over that dagger. There were 10 false electors on the Republican side here in Wisconsin who took it upon themselves to declare themselves the, the uh, real electors to our electoral college. I don't know if you knew that, but uh, in December, they submitted this false slate uh, to the Electoral College. And one of those false electors was none other than Robert Spindell, who happens to be one of the six commissioners on the Wisconsin Elections Commission. You might also not be aware that 15 Republican legislators in Wisconsin on January 5th, 2021 of all dates, one day before the January 6th coup, sent a letter to Vice President Pence to delay the counting of our electoral votes for 10 days so the legislature could meet and uh, certify its own slate. This was part of the whole plot outlined in the Eastman memo to overturn the election of Joe Biden. And one of those 15 legislators who signed that letter was Janelle Brangen, who heads the Wisconsin Assembly Committee on Elections. And there's been no accountability whatsoever here in Wisconsin for the false electors or these 15 legislators who signed that letter to Vice President Pence. Instead, the denialism and the nihilism about the November election continues. Branchen told her constituents that Trump actually won the election. And Representative Tim uh, Rampson, who was one of the 15 legislators to urge Vice President Pence to disregard this, the slate of Biden electors, he proposed a resolution just two months ago to retroactively withdraw Wisconsin's electoral votes from the Electoral College, even though the Electoral College disbanded after its vote and there's nothing in the US Constitution to allow such a thing. And of course, we have the endless fishing expedition from Michael Gableman, who also said after the election that the election was stolen. And his chief of staff, Andrew Kloster, said the same thing. And Kloster back in April said something else. He said that right-wingers need, need their own, and this is a direct quote, they need their own irate hooligans and captured DAs, captured district attorneys, to let the hooligans, like the Proud Boys, off the hook. And these are the folks who are wasting $676,000 of our tax dollars 
and counting to do a so-called investigation to try to justify their uh, outrageous comments when there is no evidence whatsoever to justify them. And then, of course, we've had this endless drumbeat of propaganda to discredit the Wisconsin Elections Commission. Uh, all of this is reprehensible. Uh, and some Republicans with integrity uh, have said so. Uh, Senator Rob Coles from Green Bay said after the Legislative Audit Bureau came out that our elections were safe and secure. Senator Republican uh, State Senator Kathy Bernier, who heads the Elections Committee in the State Senate, to her everlasting credit, has called these attacks a charade and urged uh, Gableman to wrap up his investigation uh, at, right away. Uh, and she also did a press conference a while back showing that our uh, system of checks and balances with clerks uh, and with uh, the Wisconsin Elections Commission leaves no opportunity for the kind of fraud that uh, Gableman has been speculating about. So I'm saddened to hear actually that Senator Kathy Bernier will not be uh, running for re-election. Uh, she was a, and has been a very strong voice for election integrity uh, and integrity within the Republican party. Actually, she's our own little Liz Cheney right here in Wisconsin and deserves praise for this. Now I've been wondering, and you might be wondering, what is the purpose? of this ongoing denialism and this wholesale assault on the Wisconsin Elections Commission. Well, here are my speculations about that. First, it's designed to keep feeding rancid red meat to the enraged Trumpite base of the Republican party so they will turn out in huge numbers in 2022 and 2024. Second, it's to enact laws or at least to propose bills that will make it harder for people to vote especially people who lean Democratic. And third, to sully the reputation of the Wisconsin Elections Commission so badly that partisan Republican officials in the legislature can destroy it and hand over the administration and more dangerous still, the certification of our elections, either to the legislature itself or to a particular partisan official that the legislature appoints, for instance, the Secretary of State. Uh, if the Secretary of State position falls into the hands of a partisan Republican. And this way, Republican partisans could overturn the will of the people and decide by fiat who won the election, regardless of the actual vote count, and then Wisconsin would be just like Georgia. Let's be real clear about what we're facing here in Wisconsin and around the country. We are facing an unprecedented and militant anti-democracy movement. And what does this anti-democracy movement consist of? Well, it consists of the Trump cult. It consists of white nationalism. It consists of irrationalism. You know, it's hard to have a functioning democracy when there's so much irrationalism in the country. Irrationalism about COVID, irrationalism about November 3rd, irrationalism as it manifests itself blatantly in QAnon. And on top of all this, there's a right-wing media ecosystem that feeds all of it uh, on a 24-7 basis. And there are people who believe this stuff who are connected as if by an IV tube to this right-wing propaganda machine on television and on right-wing radio. Now, January 6th occurred after I'd finished my manuscript, and I was just combing it for typos, actually, when January 6th happened. So I was only able to wave at it uh, in the introduction to my book. I mentioned it in about one sentence. But this anti-democracy movement represents a more imminent threat than anything I discuss in my book, though several of the chapters certainly relate to what's going on right now. For instance, a chapter on making voting easier as opposed to making voting harder. Uh, but I would like to talk about my book for a bit. I mean, that's one reason uh, you're here, I suppose. And so let me just say, I came to Wisconsin 40 years ago. I came here because in part, it had such a well-earned reputation for progressivism, a well-earned reputation for clean government, a well-earned reputation as a laboratory for democracy. Uh, back then when I got here, it was a scandal if a lobbyist was buying two drinks for a state senator but our reputation's gone way downhill since then. And so I got to thinking, what would it take to restore Wisconsin's pro-democracy 
reputation. And over the last seven years, the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign, we've been working on several of these problems. I mean, one, of course, is banning gerrymandering. And while we haven't achieved success there, uh, the Wisconsin Fair Maps Coalition has created a huge mass movement to accomplish this goal. The Wisconsin Democracy Campaign is part of this movement. The League of Women Voters is part of this movement. And many of you, I'm sure, are part of this movement as well. And we're not going away no matter what the Wisconsin Supreme Court says or what happens in federal court if there's an appeal after that. We will keep pushing to ban gerrymandering in Wisconsin. The vast majority of Wisconsinites uh, agree with us on this, as does the map over my right shoulder uh, indicate. Uh, that map shows that 56 out of our 72 counties have passed referendums or resolutions urging the legislature to give us non-binding, uh, to give us independent, uh, nonpartisan. Uh, redistricting like they have in Iowa and have had in Iowa for the past 40 years. Another issue that we deal with day in and day out at the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign is the problem of money in politics. Did you know that there's an expression that's gone extinct in Wisconsin just over the last seven years? That expression is, I've maxed out. And the only people who used to be able to use it were super wealthy individuals who like to throw their money around in the political arena. Up until 2015, there was a de facto limit on what one of these rich people could spend in Wisconsin on politics. And that de facto limit was $10,000. So if you'd given $10,000 to the Democratic Party of Wisconsin uh, or to Jim Doyle for governor or to Scott Walker or the Republican Party of Wisconsin, you couldn't give another dime to anybody else. So if a candidate for the state assembly called you up or the state Senate called you up and said, I, I need some money, can you help me out? Uh, if you were one of these super rich donors, you could say, you know, I'd love to help you, but I can't because I've maxed out. And I've known a couple of these super rich donors, and they loved using that expression because they could act like they really wanted to support this candidate or that candidate, but they actually couldn't. Well, today in Wisconsin, the super rich can never max out because in 2015, the Wisconsin legislature totally rewrote our campaign finance law and said that individuals now can give unlimited amounts of money to political parties and legislative campaign committees and outside groups. And get this, corporations for the first time in 100 years can also give to those parties. So we need to fix our campaign finance law and we've got to overturn Citizens United as well. I also write about a few other issues that haven't gotten as much attention as they deserve. They're a little more obscure, like prison gerrymandering and like reenfranchising the formerly incarcerated. Prison gerrymandering is the counting of prisoners as living where the prison's located and not in the community they came from. So say you're arrested and convicted in Milwaukee and you were sent up to Wapan a half, a year and a half ago. You're getting out in six months, but the census We'll still have you living in Wapan till 2030. And as a result, the Wapan area gets more representation and more resources because of that inflated count, and Milwaukee gets less. That's not fair. And it's racially biased as well. And we got to change that. Many states are getting rid of prison gerrymandering. Wisconsin needs to catch up. Now, reenfranchising the formerly incarcerated is a voting rights issue. Uh, that I think is really important. Right now, there are about 64,000 Wisconsinites who served their time and they're out of prison, but still they can't vote. They can't vote because they're on paper, as it's called. Uh, they've got probation, parole, or extended supervision. And this can last for more than a decade. That's not right either. They did their time. They should be able to vote. Many states now allow the formerly incarcerated to vote as soon as they get out of prison. And two states actually allow people to vote while they're in prison. Those two states, by the way, are Maine and Vermont. But Wisconsin's falling behind here, too. And there's a bill circulating actually right now in our legislature that would have us fall even farther behind. It wouldn't let the formerly incarcerated vote until they paid up all their court fees, fines, and restitution. These amounts can run into the five figures. I was on a a Zoom call with a, a formerly incarcerated person who said he'd have to pay $15,000 uh, if this was the law before he could vote. And there's no way he could pay that. So this amounts to a nasty poll tax on top of everything else. I've got other chapters 
on other subjects you know, uh, related to saving our democracy in Wisconsin, including tightening recusal rules for judges and one on bolstering local media. Uh, I also have two big chapters at the end that are longer than any of the others because they deal with super serious problems that are national in scope. One of those is uprooting racism and the other is moving toward economic democracy. Because you don't have an equal voice if someone has a knee on your throat and you don't have an equal voice when the super rich can drown out your voice. Uh, you know, 100 years ago, Teddy Roosevelt said, we can't have a real political democracy until we have something approaching economic democracy. Well, we're going the opposite direction right now, as you all know, I'm sure. And we got to turn that around too. If we're ever going to get to a democracy where everyone has an equal voice, that's my definition of a democracy, where everyone has an equal voice in the affairs of state. So what do we do about all this? How do we respond? Well, you've taken the first step already by being part of the League of Women Voters. Uh, it's really important for people who believe in democracy to join an organization that's doing good work in this field. And we're so lucky in Wisconsin to have so many of these organizations, not just the League, not just the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign, but Common Cause, the Wisconsin Conservation Voters, All Voting is Local, All on the Line, Block, Lit, Voces de la Frontera, and many more. And if you're not in any of these organizations yet, you sh I urge you to join one of them. Uh, whatever the issue of democracy or justice concerns you the most, global warming, for instance, any issue, there's an organization in Wisconsin, prison rights, there's Expo, for instance, join it. And join it with a friend, because it's so much easier to do political work when you join organizations with a friend. Uh, that way it isn't as discouraging, you're not as alone. Doing this work alone will uh, become a frustration for you, and you're likely to stop doing it. But if you do it with a friend, you can do it for a lifetime as I have. So. Uh, thank you for joining organizations. Specifically, to counter the anti-democracy movement that I spoke about, seems to me we need to do at least three things. First, I think it's important to uphold the voices of decent Republicans who are speaking out. Liz Cheney, of course, Adam Kinzinger, and as I mentioned, State Senator Kathy Bernier and State Senator Rob Coles. Second, we need to form a united front of all pro-democracy forces. We can't keep squabbling among ourselves and, uh, and just making uh, uh, petty differences uh, exaggerated. We've got to put our differences aside and unify to face this uh, real existential threat. And then on an individual basis, each of us needs to try to bring two or three people in our wide social circle uh, around and nudge them back or drag them back from the anti-democracy cliff. Uh, you know, there's a book out called uh, The Way Out, How to Overcome Toxic Polarization by Peter Coleman. And, and in that book, he talks about doing this. Uh, and it's not too much to ask for us to find, you know, two or three people uh, who um, are susceptible to a conversation. You know, in Wisconsin, uh, half of the voters voted for Donald Trump. Uh, and you can look at that and throw up your hands if you uh, are very uh, worried about Donald Trump as I am. And 60% of Republicans believe the election was stolen. Again, you can throw up your hands at that. But look at that statistic another way. 40% of Republicans don't believe the election was stolen. Uh, you know, among that 40%, uh, there is room for conversation. And in your own you know, whether it's exercise group or religious group that you belong to, your church or your synagogue or your mosque or your social circle, whether it's the book club or the card game or the tennis group or whatever it is, there probably are people who have different views than you do, but you know them not to be, you know, evil people. And I think we need to listen to them uh, try to connect with them in, in a non-political way, either, you know, with the hobby uh, that you know them uh, uh, as a, being a part of or the religious group you're a part of, and just try to engage them 
over a period of time, not hitting them over the head or calling them names, uh, and just try to uh, find some common ground and then gradually try to uh, bring them away from this anti-democracy movement if they're flirting with it, or if they even, uh, you know, somehow had a toe in it. I'm not talking about people who are flying Confederate flags or who have Nazi tattoos on their biceps. Uh, I steer clear of these people uh, because number one, it's a waste of time. Number two, it may be personally dangerous. Uh, you know, I'm an atheist Jew. I don't want to talk with someone who's got a nat Nazi tattoo on their on their bicep. But there are so many people in Wisconsin uh, who, uh, for whatever reason, voted in ways you might not like or are, uh, you know, listening to this IV propaganda that they're getting in their veins every day. Uh, and we need to find a way to, to bring some of them back to reality and back to a pro-democracy perspective. So uh, I want to encourage that. Uh, and none of this is easy. Uh, none of this uh, are we going to accomplish overnight, but I think we need to get on this task and we need to get on it now before it's too late, because this really is a delicate moment for our democracy. Now, if you'll indulge me for a few more minutes, I'd like to read just a couple uh, offerings from my book. One's from the appendix, uh, and it's really short, and it's called uh, How Not to Burn Out. It's really just a leaflet that I've been passing out over the years. How to Avoid Burnout, a Guide for Activists. One thing that concerns me the older I get is that we in the peace and justice and democracy movement need to make sure that we don't burn out and that our colleagues don't burn out and that the generations behind us don't burn out. We've got to grow our ranks of activists. We can't run them or ourselves into the ground. So here are some of the do's and don'ts for activists. 10 do's and 10 don'ts. Do have fun while you work. Do surround yourself with interesting, smart, fun, kind, and moral people. And also people who are good cooks and have good senses of humor. That goes a long way. Do compliment your colleagues and allies on the good work they're doing. Take vacations. We really gotta take vacations. Uh, workaholism is something we need to avoid. Workaholism can be a, a death trap. Set short-term achievable goals. Celebrate small victories. Have healthy hobbies outside of work. And as Joy knows, I've got a lot of these. I'm a bird watcher. Joy's a bird watcher too. I play tennis. I play Texas Hold'em. I play Scrabble with my wife, Jean. We watch Jeopardy at 4.30 every day and are loving watching Amy right now set these records. Uh, we love to go out for dinner uh, with friends, though we've had to cut back on that because of COVID, of course, but have hobbies. You know, enjoy the arts and music and photography and uh, poetry. Is, that's another hobby of mine. So have healthy hobbies. Seek out positive signs and developments. And this one's important. Remember, you're part of a tremendous historical movement for peace and justice and democracy with inspiring forebears who actually faced more daunting challenges than you are facing right now at this moment. And lastly, do prepare for the long haul. And then the don'ts, don't overwork. Don't work on weekends unless it's an absolute emergency. And here I am working on a weekend, but this is kind of fun actually talking with you. Two, don't become embittered that you're working harder or longer than others. This is a, a disease that workaholics have. It's a resentment bred from workaholism uh, and it's one to avoid because the resentment then will eat you up. Three, don't make petty criticisms of coworkers or allies or talk behind their backs. That's poisonous. Don't, don't play power games. Don't let your ego get out of control. Don't be a perfectionist. This one's a killer too. No writer is a perfectionist. No writer who gets anything out the door uh, more than once every three years is a perfectionist. Otherwise, uh, it's just paralyzing. Don't worry about pleasing everyone. Don't generalize or demonize everyone who disagrees with you. And this means don't say, you know, all Trump supporters or all Republicans uh, if you don't like Trump supporters or Republicans, because all you got to do is find one Trump supporter or one Republican who doesn't uh, uh, 
uh, fall into the category that you're overgeneralizing about, and you've just said something that's false. So on a literal level, you don't want to be saying falsehoods. And on a political level, you don't want to be writing all those people out of the bill, uh, out of the book of life. Don't keep score. And number 10, don't expect immediate success. My other uh, reading, which won't take more than three minutes, is from the conclusion, and it's entitled, Why I'm Hopeful. I've edited it. I always edit as I go. I was an editor for uh, 35 years. I could edit the Ten Commandments down to five if they gave me a few minutes. So I've edited this down. It's not exactly as it appears in the book. Why I'm Hopeful. I recognize that democracy has been taking a beating lately, here in Wisconsin and nationally but I don't lose heart and I don't give up. Here are a few reasons I remain hopeful. First, I travel all across the state of Wisconsin and I see the amazing work that grassroots activists are doing every day. And I'm hopeful because over the past seven years, I've seen the progressive nonprofit sector in Wisconsin unify itself and work harmoniously toward our shared goals. We've torn down our silos, we've shelled our egos, for the most part. And we've got a lot of young and impressive leaders taking on more and more responsibility. They will lead us forward. I'm hopeful too, because of the strong advocates in our legislature for pro-democracy reforms. I also take hope from the mass movement for black lives and the movement to combat the climate crisis and the activism of young people in driving these movements. Frankly, part of being hopeful is just a state of mind. Here's the great Irish poet, Seamus Haney. Once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that the further shore is reachable from here. And I do believe that the further shore is reachable from here. I also like this quote from Ta-Nehisi Coates. History is not solely in our hands, and still you are called to struggle, not because it assures you of victory, but because it assures you of an honorable and sane life. I just love that honorable and sane life. None of us is assured of victory, but I know one thing for certain. Great democracy reforms won't happen without citizen activism and mass movements. That's the lesson I learned from Ralph Nader, for whom I worked after I graduated college, and that's the lesson I learned from the people's historian, Howard Zinn, who wrote for me at the Progressive in the last dozen years of his life. On my wall at the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign is this quote from Howard Zinn. To be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It's based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, and kindness. If we remember those times and places, and there are so many, where people, who have, where people have behaved magnificently, he said, this gives us the energy to act, and at least the possibility of sending this spinning top of a world, love that image, spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however small a way, he said, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future because to live now as we think human beings should live in defiance of all that's bad around us is itself a marvelous victory. So let's defy all that's bad around us and let's celebrate all that's good around us and let's save our democracy here in Wisconsin and around the country. Thanks very much and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Matt, and I'm, um... That, that, that was a great uh, note to, to end your, your presentation on some hope. And I think we all need that. Um, we do have a number of questions, but if you have a question for Matt, if you have a thought, a, a hope, a dream, a, a fear, go ahead and post it in the Q&A and uh, we can address uh, the issue that's important to you. Bev wants to know, how do we work together to get the Freedom to Vote Act passed? Well, this is really important because the Freedom to Vote Act would solve a lot of our problems, including gerrymandering, and would also solve the problem of the voter suppression that's uh, been attempted to, uh, here in Wisconsin. After all, there are about 19 anti-voter bills submitted 
by the legislature uh, and the governor had to veto those that landed on his desk. So uh, it's kind of an urgent thing, the Freedom to Vote Act, uh, and uh, it's important for people to contact your legislators in Washington, D.C., uh, and urge them to pass the voter, uh, the Freedom to Vote Act and the John Lewis uh, Voting Act, too. We have um, Louise asks, what percent of Wisconsin citizens identify still as Republicans? There is a way of reporting that makes it seem that the Dems and the GOP are 50-50. Do you well, know much about the political demographics in Wisconsin? Uh, well, I haven't looked at the latest Marquette poll on this, but my memory is that we're about one third, one third and one third. That is uh, a third Democrat, a third Republican and a third independent. Uh, and uh, because of gerrymandering, our state legislature does not represent that accurately. Um, we have... Uh, in many elections, Democrats uh, in the in assembly races on an aggregate basis get like 54% of the vote and Republicans still get 60% of the seats. So that's some good gerrymandering if they get away with it and they have gotten away with it so far. Yeah. Um, Barbara says both sides believe our democracy is at peril, but for very different reasons. What steps do we need to take with the words we use our semantics to reach common ground on the soundness and fairness of our elections? Well, I mean, the, I'm going to quarrel a little bit with the, with the, the, uh, the, the premise, because I do think there are people like uh, Steve Bannon and Marjorie Taylor Greene who, who actually don't really believe in democracy. Uh, and don't want the people to rule and are happy with the kind of an authoritarian or even if you will, a, a neo-fascist kind of form of government as opposed to a, a democracy here. I mean, I, I saw her and uh, oh, what's the other guy's name yesterday saying they, they apologize for nothing on January 6th, nothing went wrong on January 6th. So it's, uh, it, but semantics, I mean, I, I do think, you know, there are threats to our democracy. There are threats to America. Uh, some of the uh, messaging people say, and this kind of hurts, that appealing to people's respect for democracy doesn't work as much as appealing to people's, you know, uh, sense of America. Uh, that people care more about America than democracy. I, keep, I disregard that messaging advice because I keep talking about democracy because I think democracy is really a crucial thing to stress. But I also think sabotaging our way of life, sabotaging our system of government, sabotaging uh, America, that verb sabotaging is a very uh, good word to use these days because uh, according to the messaging gurus uh, it's uh, it gets the best response yeah when you mentioned um, Matt that 60 percent of Republicans in in recent polling believe that the election was rigged or that there was fraud or whatever um, and I, I liked how you said we should look at it that 40 percent do not think that but I still would like your thoughts on how how this can be that even after so many um, you know courts and investigations and and um, putting uh, putting those results uh, recounting them numerous times and there's no evidence of any wrongdoing or or fraud yet still sixty percent of Republicans think that this election was rigged and that it was stolen from Donald Trump why is that well. Uh, you know, from Mark Twain to George Orwell, uh, really smart observers of human nature have recognized that people will believe a lie uh, rather than change their beliefs. Uh, and that's what's happening here. I mean, this has become a kind of a totem of identification for some Trump supporters or a majority of Republican Party members. It's just, it's part of belonging to that faith. Uh, and so they will not relinquish their faith in the face of a mountain of evidence. Instead, they'll cling to their faith. So it's, it's a hard thing to dislodge and we can't dislodge it by, uh, by listing, you know, a number of statistics and saying, 
although I say this all the time, that Trump went 0 for 60 in the courts. I mean, that uh, facts don't seem to, to penetrate or they don't penetrate right away. And so when I say we need to talk to people who don't agree with us, uh, part of it is just uh, just trying to get them to understand that that people who uh, are on, you know, so-called liberals. Liberalism is being discredited in and of itself. Progressivism, liberalism is being tarnished with a broad brush and just have them recognize that people who are liberal, and we need to defend liberalism in an anti-democracy moment like this, that people who are liberal are decent people uh, ourselves. That's why I say we need to establish some common ground with, with folks uh, and, uh, and then try to listen to them where they're at and then gradually bring them along. But we can't bring them along right away by saying, you know, read this study that says there were only, you know, a handful of cases of potential fraud and only one person being prosecuted for fraud in the whole state of Wisconsin. So that's a tough one. You know, we can't, we can't at least begin the conversation on a factual basis because the belief system is so strong and repelling any fact that uh, is confronting the belief system. Yeah. How important is it to save our local media? That's one of your 12 ways in your book um, to save democracy in Wisconsin. And how do yeah. we how do we save our local media? Well, it's a hard one. I mean, it's really, really important. And smarter minds than mine have been addressing this issue, most notably uh, Robert McChesney and John Nichols, who have spent much of their professional career on this very issue. I mean, there are newspaper deserts all across Wisconsin, especially in the northern half of the state, where there are, there's county after county that doesn't have a daily newspaper anymore. Uh, and uh, even in the capital, the number of reporters doing, uh, you know, state reporting from the capital uh, is dwindling. I mean, they're all of two or three AP reporters across the state right now. And uh, as good as those reporters are, they can't cover everything. As good as Patrick Marley is, the state capital reporter for the Journal Sentinel. I mean, uh, he and uh, Molly Beck and the other staffers of the Journal Sentinel, they can't cover everything. Uh, the state journal, I think, is down to one capital reporter now, Mitch Schmidt. And, and so, uh, and he's a great reporter, but we, you know, it's just, there's just too much going on. This Cap Times has two reporters, Jesse Apoyan and, and, and Jack Kelly. There's too much going on for a staff of one or two in the Capitol to cover. And uh, as a result, those who are trying to, you know, exercise their influence under the table or exercise special interest uh, favors, you know, uh, they, they're going to get away uh, like bandits. Uh, and in the north, in these uh, deserts where there's no newspaper, um, the local identity fades uh, and people then are even more susceptible than ever to you know, the national propaganda machines on right wing radio or right wing TV, or uh, for that matter, if you're, uh, you know, a, a left winger and you're only listening to MSNBC and reading The Nation and the Progressive and listening to Progressive Radio all day. It, it's a real frustrating thing that we're in our own camps and they're not, there's not enough dialogue across the way. And Joy, Joy every uh, Friday at Wisconsin Public Radio used to have someone from the left and someone on the right, where we would have a civil conversation for an hour. Disagreements, civilly. And then uh, the, after Joy left, they pulled the plug on that. And there's hardly any place in Wisconsin where you can have civil dialogue across the chasm. And that's very regrettable. The solution on local media, according to McChesney, is we need public funding. Uh, but, you know, uh, we're not getting uh, the second infrastructure package passed yet. So it's hard to know when we're going to get the public funding for media, but certainly that is logically the solution to this problem. We need to have public funding for uh, uh, nonprofit media operations uh, so that we can get news to people in our community. I mean, in these newspaper deserts, I mean, who's covering the city council? Who's covering the county board? Uh, you know, who's covering the school board? I mean, that's just outrageous that it's just not happening. Ken wonders, what was your opinion of President Biden's speech um, on the on the January 6th anniversary? He said that it kind of depressed him a little bit. Um, the, the dire nature of his language made me feel like we just might be past the brink. We'll keep working like hell, however, for democracy. Actually, I love the speech. Uh, and I thought it was the appropriate tone to take uh, that there is this 
existential threat to our democracy when we had a president who wouldn't uh, agree to a uh, peaceful transition of power. And he, and he said that a lot leading up to the election even. And, and after the election, and true enough, there wasn't a peaceful transition of power. And true enough, there was a plan for a, a coup. That's what the Eastman memo lays out. And, and these folks haven't gone away. You know, the crying shame of it is, I thought that the Trump fever was going to end on the evening of January 6th when Mitch McConnell gave a great talk and Mitt Romney gave a great talk. Uh, and even Lindsey Graham said, you know, I'm off the Trump train now. <laughs> well, he got on the Trump train pretty soon thereafter. Uh, McCaffrey got on the Trump train. The fever came raging back and it's still raging across this country. And a statistic that is very disturbing is that 30 percent of Republicans think that maybe uh, violence is justified uh, in uh, to uh, to get their way right now. I mean, that's an astronomical number, and uh, it's a number that's that's very scary, as is the white nationalism that we've seen. I mean, to see people, uh, heavily armed people, carrying Confederate flags or Nazi flags as they did in Charlottesville, or Confederate flags as they did on January 6th, you know, this is, uh, this is the real ugly underside uh, that Donald Trump has uh, given a green light to. Uh, and so we need to, uh, among all the other things I mentioned, we need to denounce racism where we see it. We need to denounce anti-Semitism where we see it. You know, the Proud Boys wear shirts saying, you know, uh, not, uh, not, a, not enough Jews were killed at Auschwitz. I mean, that's, that's what the Proud Boys are about. We have um, Steve who says, uh, one other action item that we should take is to contact our legislators. Frustrating, but necessary. Do you think it's effective, um, Matt? I mean, sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And the thing is, we never know what we're going to do, uh, when we're going to do it, when it's going to be effective. Uh, but we know if we do nothing, <laughs> we're not going to achieve anything. And so it is very important, I think, to contact legislators. Uh, I just sent out, we just sent out an e-alert uh, to our 5,000 e-list at the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign to contact legislators on that bill I talked about that would, uh, you know, make uh, people who were formerly incarcerated have to pay up every dime before they could vote. Uh, you know, here's an example of where it did help. I mean, remember Robin Voss several years ago on the Friday before the July 4th weekend uh, floated a bill that would uh, exempt legislators from the public records law. And he got so much heat from constituents and so much heat from newspaper editors that by, and maybe he got tomatoes thrown at him at the July 4th parade for all I know, because by the time he came back to Madison, uh, the next Monday or Tuesday, he dropped it. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes 110,000 people around the Capitol doesn't work. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't protest anymore. And it doesn't mean we shouldn't contact our legislators anymore. Peggy wants to know, um, do you know why it's taking so long for the Wisconsin Elections Commission to address the fraudulent electors? I don't know. Now, Law Forward has uh, submitted a complaint. I think they submitted it in February. And uh, one of the issues is uh, Robert Spindell uh, is one of the people who was one of the false electors. And the complaint is against him and the other nine. And has he recused himself from this? It doesn't appear that. He, so he's sitting in judgment of himself right now, it appears. So uh, Remember, there are three commissioners support, uh, appointed by Republicans and three appointed by Democrats. And, and if they just are in their partisan camps, nothing can happen. Yeah. So how serious do you think um, this bill to, to dissolve the uh, WEC is, Matt? And, and um, presumably, uh, Governor Evers would veto such a bill. Governor Evers would veto the bill. The bill has been introduced by Tim Rampton, who was one of the 15 electors who signed that letter to Pence on January 5th, 2021. Uh, Robin Voss has said that it's, uh, it's not something he backs. But, you know, I remember when uh, Scott Walker said, uh, don't worry about a right to work bill. It's never going to happen. 
And the second it landed on his desk, he signed it. Uh, I believe that this uh, unrelenting assault on the uh, Wisconsin democracy campaign uh, has as one of its purposes, uh, shifting duties away from the Wisconsin Elections Commission uh, and either dissolving it uh, uh, completely and, re and making up a new one or handing over the duties to the Secretary of State. Yes, Evers would veto it, but what happens if Evers loses? What happens if Evers loses the governorship and even Amy Laudenbach, the uh, former uh, state assembly rep, current state assembly rep, but she's not running for a re-election. Uh, I wonder why she wasn't running for a re-election. And then I found out two days after she said she wasn't running for re-election, she said she's running for secretary of state and wants the office of secretary of state to have more authority over our elections. So that seems to be one of the plays that is in motion right now. And the irony of the whole thing on the Wisconsin Elections Commission is that Republicans created the Wisconsin Elections Commission after they took an ax to the Government Accountability Board in 2015, which was a nonpartisan board, highly respected nationally that governed our elections and our ethics. Kathleen says, I am always concerned when activists decide they will support only those candidates who appeal to the more extreme wing of their side. Wisconsin voters tend to support moderates in elections. How can we encourage our friends to look at candidates who actually have a chance to win in Wisconsin? Not sure how to answer this because I can't tell people who to vote for or who not to vote for because we're nonprofit. Um, I do think, and I do think sometimes it's uh, that, that people who are, uh, well, I'm just thinking about Bernie. You know, Bernie wasn't on the moderate side, but he raised really important issues from a progressive perspective. Uh, was it a bad thing to encourage people to vote for Bernie if you were on that progressive side? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, I do think uh, realism is necessary at some points, especially at this point, <laughs> where our very democracy is at stake. I mean, it's one thing when you know, there's a race between Bob Dole and Bill Clinton. I mean, I, you know, I thought Bill Clinton was Bob Dole's smiley younger brother. But, uh, you know, when the differences are more stark, uh, or when someone who is running, uh, who may be running for president is really hostile to our democracy, then I think it's time to uh, put aside differences and defend our democracy. But yeah, I don't think it's an always situation. Yeah. Linda thought you had a wonderful presentation and she says she donates to you. Thank you, Linda. I'm guessing the, the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign. Can we volunteer at your office or how do you suggest we help? How can an individual, you mentioned join these different groups, but what, what can we do? In, you know, what, what's the hands-on thing we can do? Uh, Linda, you can contact me, my, uh, and anyone on the Zoom can contact me at my email, which is rothschild at wisdc.org. That's my first, that's my last name, Rothschild. There's that silent S in the middle, rothschild at wisdc.org. Uh, occasionally we have uh, volunteer opportunities, but I just think uh, everybody, need, I want to stress again that everyone needs to join a organization, get involved with that organization with a friend. Uh, on the issue that speaks most loudly to you and just do your little part. I mean, there is this wonderful quote from uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu about us all doing our little parts and that the little parts can change the world when you add them all up. And, and I've long believed that and to see him articulate that so beautifully. Uh, and I saw it for the first time right after he died. I had met Bes uh, Bish uh, Archbishop Tutu a couple times in my life and and he was, he's a real hero of mine, but I love that line about doing, doing little things and that the little things add up. Yeah. If you have a, a question for Matt or a thought that you would like him to address, you can post it in our Q&A section. We have, well, we have another 20 minutes or so um, left in this lively issues forum. So we have time to get to your, your question or your thought as well. Chris wants to know, do you have suggestions for effective strategies for reducing the impact of dis and misinformation? Yeah, well, I've, this is my lifelong task, really. Um, and so I think it's uh, just important to uh, 
speak up uh, logically and also at the value of at the level of values when we're talking to people. So when I write uh, trying to debunk something that I think is an assault on our democracy, I try to point out the, the fallacies of it on a logical basis, but also note that it's antithetical to everything best in what America stands for and really try to appeal to people on that level of values that you know we all believe in injustice and freedom and equality and liberty and this is an assault on on those values or on equality of opportunity or whatever it is i think it's important for us to reclaim those high values uh, and certainly not surrender them Mary wants to know what needs to be done to get a national coalition of pro-democratic groups, including the groups like the Lincoln Project, to work together, a concerted national campaign. Well, that's something that I'm for. As I mentioned, I think we need a broad united front here uh, of uh, well-meaning people, uh, people who identify uh, across the board, you know, the, Senate, uh, the Kathy Berniers of our state, the Liz Cheney's of our nation, all the way over to, uh, you know, to people who are much further on the left. Uh, I hope there are people working this problem nationally. Uh, I am involved in a lot of coalitions, um, but I'm not involved in a coalition that's doing this work and I want to be. So I hope I'll, I'll, I'll have an answer for you the next time I talk to you. But I don't, uh, I don't know what's being done on a national level to uh, work with uh, this to make this united front happen. I'm calling for it. I just don't know who's working on it. Yeah. Um, it, uh, Susan wonders, instead of trying to change right wingers, why isn't the answer to push for economic improvements needed by the majority, which would encourage them to vote? Well, I think there, there are a couple problems. I mean, there, there is a problem uh, of uh, economic injustice in our society and people, uh, you know, not having enough money uh, and they're just living pay paycheck to paycheck. I mean, that's a problem, uh, but not all the people who believe uh, the, or are part of this anti-democracy movement really are from that, uh, that sector of the economy. And so there's a problem of ideas too. And, and I think we really need to, uh, draw to everybody's attention the ideas that are coming out of Marjorie Taylor Greene's head or out of Steve Bannon's head. Uh, you know, these are not uh, ideas that are within the mainstream of American democracy or the American tradition, really. Uh, actually, I haven't seen this, this kind of a threat to our democracy since 20,000 pro-Nazis gathered in Madison Square Garden in 1939 under huge Nazi flags. And so, uh, just as Nazism wasn't just a, a, a problem of economic insecurity and poverty, but it was a problem of ideology. So too is this threat, a problem of ideology. Yeah. Um, Carol asks, would ending the filibuster rule help save democracy? It sure would if we could pass the Freedom to Vote Act because that would get rid of gerrymandering and would also get rid of these uh, attacks on, on voting rights and on the most pernicious effort, which is to let partisan officials decide who won elections uh, rather than the voters themselves. So that is a huge uh, thing that we've got to get done. Yeah, uh, likelihood though of that being done with uh, 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 Joe Manchin, for example, uh, being opposed to it? I don't know. He says he's for the Freedom to Vote Act, but he's not for doing what's necessary to get the Freedom to Vote Act passed. Right, the filibuster. I, I, I don't quite get that, but uh, so I don't know. You know, my crystal ball has been busted for every election since Michael Dukakis. I got that one right. <laughs> Jan says, please comment on the distribution of population in states such as Wyoming at less than 6,000 and New York at 20 million or California and Texas at 40 million and all have two senators. This distorts the vote in my, um, this distorts the vote. And my understanding is that if this was changed, the democratic vote would be in the majority. 
So there are a couple of things that are built into our constitution that are very anti-democratic small d. Uh, one is the electoral college and the other is how the Senate works. Uh, and, and yeah, having given uh, the people of Wyoming two senators and the people of California two senators it is unjust. Now, changing the composition of the Senate or how the Senate, uh, 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 how many uh, senators there are per state or per capita, I mean, these would be, these are big changes. Uh, also the uh, US Supreme Court, nine people on the Supreme Court, should it be more? I mean, getting those changes would take a lot of work too. Uh, you know, and so it's hard to know among all these changes, which are the hardest and which are the easiest. In my book, I focused on uh, on some that were easier and actually some that are hard too, like uprooting racism and getting to economic uh, equality. So I did note in the introduction that these were important reforms as well, reforming the Senate uh, and getting rid of the Electoral College. But all of this, all of these are going to take time. And right now, I think the really urgent thing is, well, the Freedom to Vote Act is crucial. And the John Lewis Voting Rights Act is crucial. And just uh, countering this anti-democracy movement person to person uh, is, is really important. Deborah wonders, do you think there is any likelihood that the anti-democracy movement will die back if Trump is indicted and tried for his treasonous activities? Well, I certainly think he needs to be indicted by the Attorney General of the United States, Merrick Garland. I don't know what's taken so long when uh, he has, when the Attorney General, like all of us, have the evidence right in our hands with Donald Trump telling the Secretary of State of Georgia, just give me 11,780 votes, go find those votes. That's election tampering, plain and simple. What is so hard about bringing a charge of election tampering? And then this, this Eastman memo, this this uh, document about six ways to stop the uh, certification of the election, that is a uh, conspiracy to commit subversion. And I don't know what more evidence he needs than that. So I'm waiting for it. And uh, yeah, I think we need to, we need to have uh, Donald Trump indicted. Merrick Garland has a legal, but more importantly, a moral and a historical obligation to do this. And I know the argument is, well, it sets a bad precedent uh, for one president's attorney general to go after the prior one. Well, it's not like they're going after the prior one for you know jaywalking, and they're going after the prior president for committing a, a heinous crime against our democracy. And so that's got to be done. Whether that would cure the Trump fever, you know, it would help. I hope, but who knows? I mean, people have been saying that Trump fever was going to break, you know, after that horrible Hollywood tape came out, and then he was elected. So who knows what it's going to take? Pat says it seems that the state Republicans in the legislature are working to set it up to take charge of the election process from federal elections to the state. How can we stop this? Well, that's what I'm concerned about. Uh, you know, the, uh, the bill put forward by Timothy Rampton would do just that. The speaker has said he's not in favor of it. But the thing about Speaker Voss right now is uh, he is not the most right-wing person in his caucus, if you can believe that. That's actually true. And he is a captive to the right wing in his own party and at the base, in his caucus, and to President Trump. I mean, the reason he appointed Gableman was because uh, Trump was criticizing him vehemently and saying he was in on the, the, the steal. Uh, and uh, I'm sure the speaker didn't like it when Sheriff Clark uh, and Janelle Brangen were holding protests at the Capitol chanting, at least Sheriff Clark was chanting and leading chants of, Robin Voss has got to go. And so, uh, you know, I'm no fan of the speaker. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think the reason he hired Gable was to cover his right flank. And the reason he may be going, um, he said he's not going to go for this dissolving the Wisconsin Elections Commission, but there's tremendous momentum at the right wing base fomented every day on right wing radio to go do this. And so I don't think I, I think that's where it's headed, whether that's what he says he wants to do or not. And maybe he'll stop being speaker uh, after the next election and he'll retire. And who knows, Janelle Brangen might become speaker. Uh, speaker Voss. 
said he wants um, the Gableman investigation to wrap up by the end of January. Um, he he also was in you know negotiations about extending the contract. What do you what are your thoughts, um, Matt, on uh, the amount of money being spent on that investigation, and specifically some of the way it's being conducted? Um, asking you know local election officials for for data from machines that they don't even use, for example. Well, this is an outrageous fishing expedition, a terrible waste of taxpayer dollars. Uh, it's being run, uh, Gableman himself has a horrible bias, predetermined bias, pre-expressed bias. His staff has a pre-expressed bias. He doesn't have the temperament for this job. He's the sloppiest attorney I've ever seen. Uh, and he's a kind of a laughing stock in, in doing the things that you're suggesting. But even worse, you know, he thinks he's the grand inquisitor. You know, he thinks he can jail the mayor of Madison and the mayor of Green Bay. This is a huge separation of powers issue. I mean, the legislature is not supposed to be the prosecutor. The executive branch prosecutes, not the legislature. Who is he to jail the mayor of Madison or the mayor of Green Bay? So this is a runaway train. Uh, and uh, I hope at some point uh, soon, and I think Voss, I don't know if he said end of January or end of February or whatever, uh, but the thing has got to be brought to a, a, a conclusion. And uh, this was uh, he, uh, Gable, uh, Voss never should have appointed Gableman, uh, and he only did it to just cover his backside. Steve wonders, how can we get a summary of bills to contact our legislators about? Bills such as the one you are talking about. Some of them are new to me. Uh, the, um, you can go to our website, Wisconsin Democracy Campaign. Uh, that's WISDC, WISDC.org, and we have uh, a lot of the bills mentioned there in the top stories, uh, and you can just keep clicking on uh, the the bill I mentioned about uh, not letting prisoners, uh, former incarcerated people vote until they paid all their debts. That's up there too. The League of Women Voters has a chronicle of legislation on your website, I know, and, and that's a very handy thing as well. Yeah. Is, Adana asks, is there a method of contacting legislators that tends to be the most effective? You know, I think you need to uh, call or write and do it in your own voice uh, and write an email that is your own. The, the, this clicking on automatic emails or petitions or things like that, less effective. I think staffers just tend to junk those. If they see it's a concerted effort where you're just attaching a name to your name to a script that's already right there in front of you and it's the same script, once the staff sees that there's, you know, 10 identical scripts coming in from different names, uh, it's not as useful as you sending a uh, an email in your own words to your own particular legislator, uh, urging that legislator to do X, Y, or Z. That's the best way to go. Yeah. Susan wants to know your thoughts on the decision by Ron Johnson to run again in Wisconsin. At least that's reported that he will announce his intention to run for re-election. I told you my crystal ball was broken because I thought mm -hmm. Ron Johnson was not going to run. I thought he was not going to run because uh, he said he wasn't going to run. He had pledged to serve only two terms. And he also has said such outrageous, reprehensible things over the last, <clears throat> especially over the last couple of years about COVID, that uh, he, uh, I think he's an easier person for Democrats to defeat. And I actually talked to a moderate Republican in the legislature uh, Oh, a couple months ago, was hoping Ron Johnson would not run because he, he thought that Mike Gallagher, uh, a congressman from up north, would be a much harder candidate to beat uh, for the Democrats. And I agree. Uh, so I'm uh, I'm a little surprised, um, though all the smart people in politics were telling me over and over again that Ron Johnson was, in fact, going to run. So I guess I should have listened. Maureen says, if we live in a district where our legislators do mostly what we like, or that we agree with, um, does it make sense to contact other Wisconsin legislators or even Robin Voss? I would. I would contact Robin Voss in the Assembly and Devin Lemihue in the uh, Senate. He's Senate Majority Leader. I'd also, if there's a bill that's come up before a committee, I would contact the committee chair and you can find out their names uh, pretty easily once you find out what the committee is. 
uh, and then send them a note as well. Karen says there is so much misinformation from media. Is there any way to hold media to stricter standards of truth? Well, this is the problem we're living in in this media age where there are outfits that are, have no respect for the truth and just want to be a propaganda outfit. I mean, I, I noticed on January 6th, I went to foxnews.com. They weren't covering anything that was going on on January 6th. They were just acting like it was a non-event. And so there isn't a way to hold media to stricter standards of truth. And, and once uh, the fairness doctrine went out the window in the Reagan administration uh, and invited in all this kind of uh, ideological media that doesn't uh, care to ever to offer uh, someone on the other side to come in and give any balance. Uh, we're left in a situation where uh, we have two media universes and, and uh, right-wingers are in their own liberal universe uh, with their own information they get. And, uh, you know, people on the progressive side sometimes are in their own universe too. I strongly recommend though reading around uh, I do recommend going to news sources that are not uh, uh, ones that totally agree with you. It, it doesn't kill you to go to foxnews.com and at least see what they're uh, talking about. And when I drive around the state giving talks, I'm always flipping the tile, the dial to listen to what's on right wing radio. I was horrified when I was going up to La Crosse last month uh, and listening to Vicki McKenna, who was just applauding people who weren't taking uh, COVID and blaming uh, Evers for the shortage of nurses because he was requiring COVID tests for healthcare workers. I mean, that was just the weirdest, ugliest uh, way to wrestle with the COVID issue, but I know that's, that, that's going on. And uh, I certainly think it's important to know what the arguments are on the other side so that we at least exercise our intellectual muscles to understand uh, that argument and be able to rebut it. Similarly, I think it's important to build some knowledge, if not some empathy, for what people are listening to, uh, if that's all they're getting. So at least you know, you know what they're consuming, and maybe uh, where you might be able to get a word in edgewise or an argument in edgewise when you're talking with them. Now, this book I mentioned by Peter Coleman about how to get over toxic polarization, he had one suggestion is just go for a walk with someone. Uh, you know, do something outside uh, with someone. And so it's just not combative. Just go and you know, just have a little casual talk. Uh, and I thought that was interesting. His view was once, you know, once you're outside and you're just kind of talking about sports or books or whatever it is, maybe you can engage or at least show the other person that you're, you know, a decent human being. So they can't just say all liberals are this. Just like I say, you know, for those of us who are liberals, we shouldn't say all conservatives are this, or those of us who are Democrats shouldn't say all Republicans are that. You want people on the other side to recognize, you know, liberals don't have horns, you know, uh, liberals are decent people too. And otherwise this, you know, all this talk about a civil war may not be just metaphoric. I mean, that is, when was the last time, there, or the last year before the last two years anyway, that you heard people talking about a civil war, another new civil war in this country? Even generals are talking about it now. I mean, that should be enough to raise the hair on the back of our necks. Well, we, we have five minutes to go. We said we'd wrap up by 2.15 and, and a whole bunch of great questions. I'm sorry we're not going to get to them all. Um, there's um, Joan... Uh, says, are you familiar with Braver Angels and um, their alliance here in Wisconsin? And I will add that I know that the League of Women Voters of Dane County um, Program Advocacy Group is looking into a possible workshop with Braver Angels on depolarization from within. Their, their uh, mission is to um, in, encourage more civil discourse between people. Yeah, I mean, Braver Angels, uh, I, I applaud the work they're doing. Ruth Conniff wrote about the work they're doing in an article she did for the Wisconsin Examiner. Uh, you can find out more information there. Uh, I'm all for it. I'd love to participate with them. I think it's really important. I'm happy to debate anybody, uh, you know, in some civil forum anywhere from the other side, even Rick Essenberg from Wisconsin <laughs> Law and Liberty, uh, who is a smart guy. Uh, but, uh, he, uh, you know, he works for really 
uh, awful people, I think. But, you know, uh, you know, he believes in argumentation. I believe in argumentation. And it's important to have civil dialogue with people on the other side. So to the extent that they're doing it, I think that's their mission. I'm all for it. Peggy says, can citizens do anything to demand accountability of, over this Gableman election review of the procedures and expenditures? I feel like this review is dragging on purely to keep election skepticism alive among some voters with no intention to conclude it. Yeah, I think you should write a letter to the editor. You should contact your legislator if you want help editing your letter to the editor. I'm happy to help. I've edited hundreds of them. Uh, again, my email is Rothschild with a small r, but I think it gets there with a big r too, rothschild at wisdc.org. Letters to the editor are helpful ways to communicate uh, with uh, people and also with legislators, because legislators are their staff anyway. They look at letters to the editor as kind of a gauge. Yeah. Well, maybe um, just give you last word, uh, Matt. Uh, maybe <laughs> leave us with... Um, with the most important thing that we can do um, the, for the rest of this month to help save democracy in Wisconsin? Well, I'd urge everybody to uh, contact your legislators in Congress about the Freedom to Vote Act. Uh, I want everybody uh, who's not in the League of Women Voters, who's on the Zoom, to join the League of Women Voters. Uh, there are chapters all across the state. Join the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign uh, and talk to identify two people that you know uh, who maybe uh, were susceptible to some of this anti-democracy propaganda, but are otherwise decent people, and try to find a way to start a conversation with them, and start by listening to them and figuring out where they're at, and trying, you know, over the next couple months to to bring them back from this uh, abyss of anti-democracy, which is very scary. Uh, I just want to quote, uh, end with a quote from W. H. Auden, who was my first love of poetry anyway, in poetry, who had a poem, September 1939, that ends this way. Uh, May we, beleaguered by the same negation and despair, show an affirming flame. And so we've got to show that affirming flame, affirm the things that we believe in, uh, affirm democracy, affirm fair play, affirm voting rights, uh, you know, affirm kindness and neighborliness, uh, and we'll win this way. And I should um, thank you. Thank you so much, Matt, uh, for being with us. Matt's book is going to be the featured book for the League of Women Voters of Dane County's February book discussion. You can take part in that um, those discussions Tuesday, February 15th or Thursday, February 19th from 10 to 11.30 a.m. You can order your copy of the book from UW Press, or you can uh, borrow a copy from the Dane County League's office library. If you have questions uh, or want to be a part of the discussion, please email books at lwvdanecounty.org. And I believe that was also put in the chat. So um, good discussion coming up uh, with uh, the, the book discussion in February on Matt's book. Um, Dane County League members should also watch for this coming Monday's e-news in your email. You can find out more about a virtual social event, a hangout that we are planning for January 18th at 7 p.m. Maybe we can have some fun together and um, blow off some steam together and one of Matt's uh, prescriptions for avoiding burnout and talk about um, some, some fun things uh, during this uh, social gathering. The next uh, forum for the League of Women Voters of Dane County is scheduled for February 1st. It's going to examine the issue of evictions. All of this, uh, there will be or is more information on the website, uh, League of Women Voters of Dane County. So. That's it for this uh, Lively Issues Forum. Thank you for being with us. Happy New Year, everyone. Stay well, stay strong, and let's make it a great year for democracy. Bye -bye. So long. Thank you.